Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery, Part 322. <clears throat> we're continuing with our lesson title, Classroom in the Heavens. This will be Part 5. <clears throat> As we have previously looked at the book of Revelation and <clears throat> concluded <clears throat> The uh, seals of the seven seal mystery scroll are being opened. Events are taking place on the earth, <coughs> which constitute judgments that are crafted to fall on the human race. These judgments <coughs> are crafted to provoke those who missed the rapture <coughs> to repentance and we see <coughs> in uh, <coughs> verse 9 <coughs> that there are a group of uh, martyrs who have just <coughs> basically <coughs> done this they stand as a testimony against <coughs> the renegade luciferians that have taken over the earth and imposed the anti-God societies. <clears throat> this leads to a point in which judgment now is about to fall on them. The Luciferians. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> but we find before judgment does fall on them, there is a brief prelude or interlude in which <clears throat> certain individuals are sealed with the protection to keep them from experiencing the effects of the judgment. So, turn to Revelation, the seventh chapter. We're going to read verses one to four. <clears throat> we read, and after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, <clears throat> until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So what we find here, <coughs> the <coughs> it speaks of them being redeemed and then being the first fruits. Now the first fruits basically constitute the old covenant arrangement, <clears throat> the first of a uh, harvest. The first that comes up of a harvest that is going to follow, <clears throat> belong to the nation of Israel, but the first that comes up belong to God. Okay. So you would look at that as a tithe. Uh, in a way, yes, or it's more of an offering. Okay. Well, a tithe is a form of offering, but all right. <clears throat> but tithe is a tithe is a percentage. Sure. <clears throat> but the first fruits are not given any number. <clears throat> they constitute whatever it is that's the first <clears throat> that basically precede the greater overall group. What would determine to either the person, or in this particular instance, the quantity of that first threat? Quality. The quality of it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Hang on. If everything is, let's say that you've got a fantastic harvest this year, the quality is better than it has been for 50 years, mm -hmm. what would determine the percentage of the first fruits of that quality harvest? What comes up? What comes up? Okay. What constitutes Cause it's, cause the it's first to grow? So it's 10%. Yeah. 
No, it could be more than 10%. There's no measure. Right. <clears throat> the tithe is whatever it is, it's 10% of that. So in other words, whatever's in the... the first fruits is whatever the first of the overall that makes its appearance. Okay. okay. That's what constitutes okay. the first fruits. Gotcha. Gotcha. So they never put a measure on the first fruits. But whatever constitutes the first fruit, right. that belongs to the Lord. But that's really in the hearts of the person giving the offering, isn't it? Okay. Yes. <clears throat> uh, in the New Testament, mm. it says um, the first fruits of your increase. Right. I see that. Yes. <clears throat> yes. So if you get a raise, yeah. then uh, whatever you make of whatever you get for that week constitutes the first fruits. You raise whatever it is, that's <clears throat> what the, what is the first of the overall the yes. Yes. percentage of what you are, you're gonna get. Paula White wants us to send what we're going to get and we haven't yet got. Yeah, for a no. month. For a month, all right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a yes. Sorry. Yes. Oh, anyway, <laughs> so this constitutes the first fruits of the nation of Israel. What does that mean? That means Israel has not <clears throat> received its Messiah. Now, let's get back to, excuse me mm -hmm. for this question, let's get back to the reason that the Father decides of the people, because they're Old Testament people, who do not have the promise of heaven, he wants some form of representation in the heavens. What's the thinking behind that? Because the nation is going to accept the Lord, and when it accepts the Lord, they're going to come under the new covenant. Okay. These already have accepted the Lord. Right. So they are, as a group, accepted to okay. the Lord. Okay. Out of those that are ultimately going to accept Him, which you won't never get to heaven, they're going to be on earth. Right. But both of them are going to be under the new covenant. So therefore, it's because they're messianic, and not because there's some special dispensation that He's doing. Okay. Yeah, okay. because of the fact that they are the first of the nation to be right. <coughs> covered by the new covenant. Yes. Of the 144,000, are there those that are going to make the bride? No. No, because they didn't make the rapture. My understanding, they're not fully adopted. Okay. Right, that's the point, because they're not fully adopted. My understanding is, therefore, they can't be pillar angels. No. They can't be... Uh, Prototicus. Well, they are a form of Prototicus, aren't they? Uh, in the sense of being the first fruits. Right, but they didn't make but the they, rapture. Yeah. Okay, okay. They'll never be in that, cla in that class, in that category. category. This is basically all having to do with the transition from the old covenant to the to new the covenant as pertains to Israel. Right. That's why you have bloodlines here. <clears throat> now remember what we said, in Christ you lose your human identity. Yes. But these go to heaven by their identity. Because of that, Judah, okay. Issachar, Zebulon, they're all going into eternity according to their standard human ident Jewish identity. Since born-again Christians, sons of God, who are not prototokos, I'm going to make that clear, who are not prototokos, mm -hmm. also lose their identity by coming into Christ, because when you step into Christ, you lose your identity. How is it that Messianic Jews, they've stepped into Christ, hold on to their identity? Because of their special relationship. So then there is a special dispensation for them? Yes. Okay. That's what makes them first fruits. Okay. <coughs> Gentiles couldn't do this, right. only Israelites. Right. So let's go on. <coughs> so there's a brief lull for them to be sealed. Now we want to take a look a little bit at where they come from. How it is it that they are, who they are, and where they arrive from. Scripture indicates these were brought to repentance. That something happened that caused them to make the decision that made them part of the first fruits. The two witnesses. Exactly. Scripture indicates these were brought to repentance through the work of the two witnesses. The two witnesses are connected to the angel YHVH. Revelation 10th chapter, verse 1. So what you're looking at is a transition taking place as it pertains to Israel. 
remembering that Israel has totally rejected its <coughs> Messiah, don't want anything to do with him. And he, in turn, has said, I don't got to have anything to do with you until you call out to me. Did you want to read Revelation 14 first? <coughs> we're going to read Revelation 10 okay. first. Then we're going to go to 14. Okay. Revelation 10, 1. <clears throat> and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. So we see something here in his identity. There's only two places in Revelation where you have this appearance described. Here, and in Revelation, the first chapter. Turn over to Revelation, the first chapter. <clears throat> Verse 14. 15. His head and his ears were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes was a flame of fire. His feet like undefined brass, if it, as if it were burned in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. Verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Now go back to Revelation 10. So we see the similarity here between the Creator and this created being. And we see in context of this created being, there's more than one because this is another angel came down. So there's a group of them. <clears throat> we see that this group, of course, is patterned after the Creator. Yes. This group is basically called the Morning Stars. We call them the Dawn Stars because it comes from a word which means early morning, dawn. And we see that they're identified in a way in which they have authority that's given to them. Yes. And conferring authority, the only way you can confer authority is if you confer a name mm. that constitutes that authority. In Revelation 2, I can't remember the verse, but it's way down there. Uh, 17, I think, the very last, no, 28. Revelation 2.28 Elohim tells the elders who are going to rule with a rod of iron that he will give them the morning star which we understand now is the authority to rule over the entire creation as the dawn stars are currently doing well it also confers glory okay uh, the dawn stars have a unique glory which is patterned after the creator of course so the sons of God are going to have a same authority only on a greater scale a great now, you said the same authority or a greater authority? Greater. Okay. Greater. <clears throat> so, having said that, uh, now go back to Revelation 14, verse 1 to 4. Why? Because we see these who are redeemed from the earth now in the heavens. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. And then we're going to go back to find out how they got there. Revelation 14, <coughs> 1 to 4. And I looked, 
and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, with him 144,000, having their father's name written in their foreheads. That took place on the earth when they were sealed. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Those are the elders. They're the only ones that are described as having harps. Okay. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144 and 4,000 which were redeemed from the earth. <clears throat> These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. The first fruits, meaning the first from the nation of Israel to make the transit from the old covenant to the new covenant. Since they didn't make the rapture. Mm -hmm. 144,000. Do you describe them as being in the Godhead? No. Okay, so they uh, they don't know as they are known. No. Interesting. No, they have to follow the land. <clears throat> okay, so coming back to the learning of the song here in verse 3, mm -hmm. should we understand that the pillars who are in the Godhead and are known as they are known? Mm -hmm know this song or are they unable to know the song? No, they wouldn't be able to know. They're talking about the experience 144 have, which okay. is unique unto themselves. Okay, so no group can know the song because they haven't had the experience, yes. even if that group is higher than the other. Okay. Yes. Now, <clears throat> go back to Revelation 11. We're going to look at the angel. This is covering the background of how these got redeemed, how they made the transit. Revelation 11, starting in verse 1. Revelation 10 talks you, tells you about the angel. Gives you the description. We don't go into it because uh, basically he's got this little book which is given to him by the Prototokos to make his proclamations. Later on, he takes the book, gives it to John. It's a transference of authority to the church, who John represents. It's a prophecy of things to come, which only John is authorized to give. Would you Cover describe it on. as a transference of authority to the church or to the protocols? To the church. John represents the church at this okay. point. He isn't glorified. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Revelation 11, 1. It was given unto me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without, the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. That's three and a half years. <coughs> Talking about events taking place on earth in Jerusalem. It's totally corrupted. It is defiled. The only place that's not defiled is the inner sanctuary. Where you have a remnant of the people that are loyal to God are cloistered. So the part where it says measure it not for it's given to the Gentiles is because it's corrupted. Not because it doesn't come under their administration. Yeah, yeah. The whole yeah. thing. He says, "Don't don't bother with any of this other stuff." Because it's, it's corrupt. It's totally corrupting. Gotcha. The one that you're interested in is the inner sanctuary where the holy of holies is, because that's where the remnant of the righteous are, that still are, are committed to God. But the implication is it's the Gentiles who did the corrupting. Yes. Hmm. <clears throat> when it says the Gentiles, it's also referring to uh, the gods. Okay. Yeah. The Antichrist has done sure. his thing here, so sure. he's wiped out everything. And uh, <clears throat> the only thing that's left is a remnant, a righteous remnant. Then he goes on. <clears throat> Within these righteous that are in the sanctuary, the Holy Folies, are the two witnesses. I will give power unto my two witnesses. They shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, 
clothed in sackcloth. That's three and a half years. <coughs> so he's saying at a certain point, he is going to give them supernatural power to step into a ministry waiting for them. <coughs> yes. Why are they wearing sackcloth for three and a half years? Uh, it's morning. The morning, the desolation of God's sanctuary. It's a sign that they recognize the reprehensible uh, 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 detestation that these people have done to something that's holy. When Jewish tradition, something happens, somebody blasphemes, you rent your tunic, you put off your clothes, and you put on sackcloth, mourning this defiling of something that's holy unto God. Sounds like an expensive wardrobe. Expensive. <laughs> well, it's part of their their culture. Sure. The thing of it is, is what I'm what I'm picturing, Mr. Jones, is is a continuous three and a half years. That's that's, that's a long time to continue be in the morning stage. Is there no joy in between any of that? No, of course not. No. So the sign of the veneration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in the face of corruption, you don't rejoice. Sure. You can't. You look up ahead, overhead. There's a morning cloth over here. Why? Because the thing has been corrupted. God spread blackness over it so everybody would know. The humans, they don't understand, but the Luciferians know why it's that way. It's morning. God's been in mourning ever since this Luciferian revolt took place. Mr. Jones, I yes. feel like that every day in this life here. Mm -hmm. I have this unsettled morning that I know there's better times and I know I have a high position and, I, and I'm going to teach a lot of people to make the rapture. So the whole thing is, Mr. Jones, I'm in mourning right now just existing in this place. Sure. Of course, your spirit is not exactly in a state of delight. But let's go on. <clears throat> so they receive power, supernatural power. Verse 4, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. What does that mean? Well, we'll take a look. He's referring to a, uh, <clears throat> a scripture in Zechariah. Can you explain how John takes over the narrative in verse 4? How he takes over the narrative. Mm -hmm. My understanding was that it was white three speaking from verses one through three. Mm -hmm. And in verse four we hear John taking over the narrative. Well, it's the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, giving you revelation knowledge. Verse 5, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now, what we want to take a look at is what the conclusion of their ministry is. Then we're going to go to look at the identity of who they are. Okay. <clears throat> Drop down to verse 8. Revelation, 11th chapter, nine, to verse uh, 13. This is the essence and the quintessence of uh, the influence that they make. They're killed by the beast. The dead bodies lie in the street for three and a half days. Verse 9. They of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. So they've made an open display for the whole world. Everybody can see them. It's, it's a supernatural close open circuit TV. Wherever you are, you're going to see this scene in Jerusalem with these two guys. And everybody around the world, it gives you an understanding of the supernatural ability that the Luciferians have. It says they send gifts one to another. 
If you're in Alaska, you're going to send somebody a gift who's in New York. How do you do that? You have the ability to transit natural forces and send one thing to another. Uh, this goes on for a certain period of time. And the Father and His wisdom is allowing this to happen because they think that they have triumphed over these two witnesses. Now, Verse 11, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet. Great fear fell upon them which saw them. Who is it that sees them? The whole world. And they heard a great voice from heaven, Sprototokos, saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand. And the remnant were frightened and gave glory to the God of heaven. This is where the 144 come in. They see this. <coughs> they immediately accept the Messiah because they know this is from him and in that respect they are taken from the old covenant into the new covenant as the first fruits <coughs> of the nation of Israel back to the sending of gifts just for a brief second mm -hmm. are we seeing Luciferians and humans sending gifts or just humans well it, both okay. both everybody's rejoicing right. and in this Everyone respect, is under the influence sure yeah. in this respect God pulls the rug out from underneath them because he shows his power over Absolutely. death, over all that the Luciferians have, even the beast. And nobody can um, reverse this. They stand on their feet. The, the sky opens up. They're told to come up. The cloud descends. They go up in the cloud. And that's it. 144,000 see this. They repent, they're sealed, and they're prepared for Revelation 14. 